welcome to this week's program. We're going to be talking about things like uh, blue fittings. When do you use blue fittings on your irrigation system? We're going to be meeting the Young Farmer of the Year and also having a wee look at a bit of a preview of one of the trainers involved with the Rickerton Winter Festival. But in just a moment, it's Cropping with Dennis. <music> Dennis, you've just got back from the UK. Yes, indeed, Rob. We had five weeks in the UK and Ireland and um, in Europe, and uh, most enlightening, some really good experiences and some bad ones. So what's happening over there that, that we should know about? Well, certainly in the cropping scene, we had a very good look at the English um, cropping scene. Uh, stayed with some people in Lincolnshire, which is sort of the heart of, that's where the cereals, big cereals um, field days are and they were just on at the time and had a very good look around those farms and um, I, th I think they've got a problem actually and, and part of their problem is uh, how narrow their rotation is, it's extremely narrow. They start with wheat, go to barley and then follow with canola and that's it. That's it? That's the end of it. That's almost Then all you go back to wheat again? Wheat again, yes indeed. So is their fertiliser input pretty big? Yes, can be quite big in some of those crops. Um, Certainly, uh, occasionally they move into potatoes, as a, uh, very seldom, but a, a few acres of potatoes, and a few oats, and, and that's about it. But uh, certainly not as big as uh, some horticultural crops, but um, basically uh, they're leading down a, a line of um, potential build-up for diseases and weeds that they can't handle because of that narrow um, yeah, rotation. Say. You know, they're, they're relying extremely heavily on canola for its ability to become a, uh, a biofumigant in that situation. And uh, as we know, when, when um, brassicas break down in the soil, um, they let off um, properties uh, from the decaying um, sea, uh, yeah, well, foliage, yeah, 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 yeah. rotting, which sterilise the soil and, and, um, and make it okay. But th there's an end to that, and they can, they'll probably, it's a bit like continually taking penicillin. You know, at some stage, you're going to uh, develop a resistance to that of something or another and, and what, all it needs is we've seen it with herbicides is that uh, one or two plants survive and you keep going down that track and using that same thing again well you're going to end up with um, a, an off type that uh, is totally resistant to what they're doing and that's my concern for them. Mm. Yes. Dennis are they, are they coming back into cropping was at one stage the, the British were being paid to not grow anything? Yes, they are really coming back into cropping, and, and there wasn't a lot of country that wasn't cropped that we saw. And you know, we were on a train trip from um, Edinburgh to Torquay, and so that's from one end of England yeah, to, it is really. right down through the centre to the bottom, and had a pretty good look at things. And um, yes, they're, uh, there's not a well until you get down to Devon area where, where the pastures really come in, and you see some Devon cattle and mm. some sheep and. Uh, a few things like that. It, it's mainly uh, sort of London and above. It's mainly um, cereals and uh, for miles and miles and miles and miles. Because you sort of see in the, I guess we watch the television, I think it's rolling country with lovely green grass, but it's not necessarily. Well, it is very much rolling country. You know, there's very little waste country as such. They can farm just about all of it. Um, the only waste is, is, is the villages and the castles. <laughs> <laughs> but would you suggest that we're actually ahead of them? Well, I don't know ahead. We have a lot more choices, and we are so fortunate in having those choices in terms of our diverse rotation and crops that we can successfully grow. Um, you know, they have a pretty miserable sort of a harvest period and a pretty wet sort of a winter, mm. and that sort of uh, dictates what they can and can't do. And of course, you know, they do a lot of um, drying of crops and things like that. So. Our sunshine and our um, our um, latitude yeah, is, is and, and yeah. Did anyone talk to you about yields, or were they a bit closed mouthed about that? Well, no, their yields are pretty good, and and the crops were set up pretty well. Um, I think they're going to wheat conservatively. I think they would do sort of ten ton. Um, their barley's look as if they're almost too heavy, just about ready to uh, to lodge. But one real thing that they've really got a problem with is the black grass. And really? it, they just cannot control it with that rotation and what they're doing. It is getting to the stage where it's a bit like a, a field that's full of cleavers here. The, the black grass are just dragging the crops down. And you could see from the elevation of a train, you could see down into these crops, 
um, you can see huge areas that have just uh, completely been dragged down by this black grass because it, it grows so much quicker than the crop, gets above the crop and then dominates it and um, it lodges in itself and pulls the crop down and so... What a mess. Yeah. Absolute mess and so you know we've had this incursion of black grass uh, in New Zealand. Um, yeah the, we don't need it. We don't need it and exactly. it, stay on top. S subsidies are they still getting payout? Yes basically Rob I talked to a few of them farmers about that and, and the subsidy they say in a typical um, I suppose you call it reasonably intensive cropping program the subsidy pays for their annual fertilizer costs. So if we relate that back to our fertiliser costs, it's quite a little leg up. Um, mm. But the, unfortunately, the subsidy is paid to the farmers not on productivity or on the crops they grow, purely on the acreage they own every year. Now, that acreage could be in forest, it could be in pasture, it could be a park, it could be intensive cereal, it could be even sugar beet, for instance. It's still just on per acre that they own or per okay. hectare they own. Briefly organics? Organics, well um, we are in Italy and talking to some lemon growers and we, we saw the uh, absolute ultimate in marketing. They handed us some lemons and we were trying to talk to these Italians who didn't understand um, English very well, handed over some lemons and they said trying to get to, through to us that it was organic and they said look, 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 look. So you got the lemon, a branch and a leaf and on the leaf was a lacewing, aphid, and scale. Well, lacewing control aphid, but in terms of whether that lemon was grown organically or not, absolutely no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> if you got the bugs with the product, you no doubt about its branding, it was organic. <laughs> Indeed. Coming back home, uh, mm -hmm. the Euro Malt filled their contracts. Yes, um, after last year's sort of stop go, stop go, issuing about three contracts before they, they got what they wanted, this year a contract came out, um, substantially less than last year as, as we know the cereal prices have come down and farmers took to that and uh, they were oversubscribed and so um, they effectively cut that contract, the area that farmers had signed up in half and said well yes we'll give you half, um, which I doubt fills their total requirement and they're actually going to bring another contract out. Well, there's probably no guessing as to uh, whether that other contract will be higher or lower in price. So it's an interesting way of doing business, but some, something that's been foreign to malting growers in this country for a long time, something we don't embrace, something we probably don't want. Um, you know, in the, in the past, the, the, the loyal growers who've been malting growers have stuck with the, with the malting production hmm. and really they need to be looked after properly not uh, bandied around on um, whims of world markets and things like that. Um, after yeah. all the price of beer, it's cash business, hasn't come down, won't come down and so the growers are looking for a fair deal. What is P contracts? Yes, what is uh, under, under new ownership, um, interesting and, and uh, they, have, they have embraced the fact that uh, they require more peas for the coming year and they've changed the payment terms which used to be if you harvested an early crop sown in August might have been harvested in December. You never got paid for that until the 30th of April. So the farmers became the bank. So Waddies have looked at that and uh, they will pay 20th of the month after um, the month of harvest of those crops now and they've kept last year's price which is, is good of them in, in light of what's happened with the cereals and they're offering bonuses for quality. So good on what is. Things are looking up in that area. Dennis, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we're going to be talking about when you use a blue fitting on your irrigation pipes. So medium density, when do we use that? Well, these are P80 and P100 pipes, and typically they have a very wide range of pressure rating. So depending on whether we're going uphill or downhill or, or what the topography is and what the pump pressure or where the water's coming from will determine different pressure ratings. But essentially we can use these with bloat aids, so we can use them in dairy farms. We can use them in sheep and beef. And in fact, uh, these pipe systems can go up to 25 bar. So 25, what's the bar? 
Um, well, one bar essentially is 10 metres of water head. Um, so if we had a hill that was uh, 50 metres high and we had a pipeline coming down, the pressure at the bottom would be 5 bar or 50 metres. So, or very close to that. So this is what gets used mostly now? This is a pipe type that is used much more frequently in most rural areas and actually has quite a large uh, flexible pressure range. It is a harder product, it is a tougher product, uh, not quite as forgiving as low density where low density is very flexible. Uh, but this actually has a much broader pressure range and pipe size uh, we manufacture up to 630 millimetres, so, so physically a quite a large pipe, right down to 20 millimetre. Tell me about the couplings, because they look as though they're a bit different. Yeah, uh, each of these ranges of fittings actually have a slightly different fitting process. So this particular one is manufactured by RX, uh, and has a, a nut, which is this piece, a grip ring which sharp grips hold on to the pipe to make sure it doesn't pop out. Uh, and a sleeve. Now when you get the fitting is pull this out and then make sure that the o-ring is in an outside cavity. Then just loosely do this up and in this case we don't need to chamfer the pipe, we can just have it nice and square and then we just insert that and you'll feel that there's no insertion force required to get that in. And it will actually just push up against uh, some, some little plates. And then we're able to just do the product up. And then we'll find that it actually pulls the o-ring into a tighter cavity. And then we fully tighten this up with a wrench till this is fitting right up against uh, this plate here, and that's then fully inserted. You, you said something that sounded Mongolian or whatever it was, a champion, what, what, was, what do you mean by uh, that? Ah, right, yes. Um, for uh, other fittings range, so uh, this is FIP comes from Italy, or Placine that comes from Israel. Uh, in both of these fittings ranges, we actually use a tool called a chamfering tool, which takes a, a small wedge of plastic off the end. Like a pencil sharpener. Like a pencil sharpener, or exactly like a pencil sharpener. And so we end up with a chamfered end on the pipe. So that chamfered end... So that comes end, up and goes in, so that, that's taking the edge off. Yes, taking the edge off. And what that does is that it assists uh, that uh, pipe in going past, in this case, if I take the, I hold that, that right. Yep. <coughs> so we've got a nut, uh, a grip ring and sleeve, very much like the other product. And then in here, we have a D-shaped ring. And this D-shaped ring just sits in the fitting. And that's what that is. And we just, once again, loosely do that. And then the chamfered end of the pipe will actually, you can feel it push past the thing and then we just do that up. And in this case, we just do it up by hand. Okay, we don't need to put tight tools on this. So when, I know it's probably a dumb question, but when do you use each one of those or is it just a personal choice? Personal choice. Um, and you realise that, in fact, um, in this range, uh, we go up to 63 millimetre. In these two ranges, it goes right up to 110 millimetre, so quite a big range, greater than our range. Um, so there are circumstances where we would need to do 75 millimetre pipe, for instance, uh, we would choose out of this range. Um, Just to recap, we use this when you're doing dairying for troughs, correct. You're doing it for getting water that's under a fair bit of pressure from yep. one point to another. Absolutely, yep. So, uh, hand fit for these, the Placine range. So if I take this, this off. And that's when you use your pencil sharpener for the one of a better term. Yeah, correct. So that's the Placine range. 
and then we have the FIP range where the fitting principle is very similar. So past the grip ring, you can feel it push up against the O-ring, and then we're going to insert past the O-ring, and then do this fitting up. Once again, in the smaller sizes, we can just do that by hand. Yep. And then in the this range, which is your own range, you need you need to tighten it up with a ring. Correct. But there is no, um, you don't feel the O-ring when you insert through this. Mm. It's very, very easy fit, fitting. And it is a personal choice. And it's all about personal choice. This year's Young Farmer of the Year went down to the wire. There was two people very, very close. In fact, it was a tie. And it all came down to a buzzer call by a person who was leading, and he got the answer wrong. Matthew Bell ended up with the cloak of knowledge. We talked to him straight after the break. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We'll get you thinking. I think it's all working well, Jack. My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking, think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking, think water. It's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of we'll everything. Get you thinking, think water. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. Congratulations on winning the, the cloak of knowledge, but let's have a look at your background. What, what, what's your background in farming? Yeah, so I was brought up on a dairy farm actually. Mum and Dad were dairy farming up around Morrinsville. So I grew up on dairy farms with my extended family. Um, I, most of them are sheep and beef guys. There's a few dairy farmers in there, but I'd sort of sort of been almost a 50-50 sort of background in being brought up. And then Mum and Dad, about 10 years ago now, Dad got sick of milking cows and didn't really like staff because he has a short temper. But um, and that wasn't it didn't come down through the generations though. I think I've got better control of it <laughs> than he has. Uh, so then we, um, yeah, mum and dad bought a sheep and beef block just as I think I was about thirteen or fourteen. So sort of brought up on a dairy farm, but then when I sort of really was able to be helpful on a farm, I guess um, was into the sheep and beef world. But then moving forward into that, I also still did a lot of relief milking when I was younger. Just the money's superb for a young guy. And so that was sort of, I'd always wanted to be a farmer, I think, since I was little, like just following what dad and his dad had done in the past, but just it appeals to me on so many levels. So we'd spent, yeah, my holidays used to be spent from school down on my auntie's um, station in the King Country, well, up in the King Country from here. Just, I loved it, I love everything about it, just never get sick of it. So, why dairying? The pathway to owning your own um, piece of land, so that's, that's what I hold in my head and my dream is to own my own piece of dirt and realistically I cannot see how you can do it with the sheep and beef industry currently whereas with the dairying industry there's such a uh, like a great pathway to get there starting from right down at the junior or even relief milking level and then into junior intermediate senior dairy assistants herd manager assistant herd. there's all these steps and they're all really achievable if you put your head down and work like even right through to 50-50 share milking or equity managing, that's all very achievable. To buy your own farm outright is probably the biggest step there, but I believe it's still achievable if you want it enough. I think it's, it is harder, but I think if you want it bad enough, you'll make it happen. So, so you're working on a farm at the moment and it's, it's a corporate? 
Yeah, so the farm I'm currently working for is a line long field. It's part of the line farm partners group, and we it's a yeah, it's a corporate style dairy farm. So there's um, absentee owners, I guess you would say, or absentee investors. But it's an equity manager sort of setup. So we've just started on the first of June. So the first year is a trial for us. We're going to see if we like working for them. They're going to see if we can do what we said we can. Like, obviously, I wouldn't have taken the job if I didn't think this is where I wanted to be. So it's realistically we are six eight months away from potentially owning it'll probably only be that little patch out there but it's it's a but start it's, it's my little patch of dirt which has been my dream since i was little so that that's why we took this job like we were heading down that traditional 50 50 sort of route and then this came up and we sort of thought oh yeah that's interesting and then i never i guess never fully considered equity managing because but we got into it and i think this is yeah we will be for a long time so it's all very exciting really looking to get stuck in and start owning some land that'd be awesome how big's the farm so with 283 <laughs> hectares in total that's right around the boundaries approximately 275 hectares in paddocks that i can make um, milk off and so it's a thousand eighty cows at peak that's a target through a 70 bar road tree automatic cut removers most of the mod cons the only one we don't have is sort of an auto drafting system not yet anyway We'll have to see how that goes. Fully irrigated, five pivots uh, through Mayfield Hines irrigation scheme, and then the balances, those long single sprinklers. So it's, yeah, it's the sheds in the middle, the races are superb. It's, it's what, I guess, in my opinion, you call just about the model farm in terms of the way it's set up. Probably, yeah, there's very little to fault here, I would say. Nutrition, you think that's pretty important, and you feed and bale. Yes, so we, uh, with the availability of grain, especially in Canterbury, and how um, great it is for the cows in terms of their nutrient and balancing their diet. We do feed around about 250 kilos of barley per cow per year, locally sourced, of course, in the Canterbury. And then uh, the balance of the diet is uh, silage, maybe a, a tiny bit of palm kernel, but only if we absolutely have to. And so it's just looking, just sticking to the basics, grass, silage, and then uh, um, grain, pretty much. So a nice simple sort of system and just making sure the cows are fully fed every day that's our big one is every day they should they should never ever go hungry not once and obviously pasture is a big focus yeah so pasture it's the cheapest thing on your farm it's the cheapest to grow and it's it's great for the cows pretty much all year round there's obviously little things sort of through the spring it may lack a bit of fiber through the summer it may be a bit high in fiber but you can balance it out that's sort of why where barley fits into the system nicely because it can help deal with those little issues but the majority is trying to grow as much pasture as we can so we're ta hopefully going to grow the target is around is about 17 tons of dry matter this year and that's I don't think that's the max that this farm will grow so it's a new conversion and it was converted from a cropping farm so it's still probably got five or six probably year five and year six is when we'll really start to turn into a dairy farm or the dirt will turn into dairy and dirt and really start to get cranking so we're yeah that's our big focus and just making sure that there are no limiting factors to pasture growth, whether that's making sure the irrigation's right, making sure the nutrients are all there for the farm, uh, for the plant is all readily available, but obviously not wasting it either because we're paying to put those nutrients on. So we want to be making sure that it's all utilized as best we can. Now you winter your cows off farm. Yep, yep. So at the moment, our, I looked at my Aquaflex yesterday and our average soil temperature is 1.5. So conservatively, we're probably growing half a kilo a day maybe so it's cold so yeah the nature of canterbury farming is we want to maximize the area for milking so all our cows are currently off our runoff block up just um at the base of mount summers on fodder beet and kale and swedes just depending on how we sort of see fit to use it and so that's where all our cows are at the moment we've got a handful just over the back there but they're just the ones that we didn't quite have enough space for so and we had a little bit extra grass so we'll keep them here and matt you're very keen on native plants yeah, it's something I personally take a lot of pride in. I want people to drive past my farm and go, wow, look at that. Doesn't that look good? So that, that starts mm -hmm. right from the front gate. Like we planted some little native grasses out there a couple of days ago. Just It's it's also one of the things that attracted me to the Align group is they put a lot of emphasis on the appearance and like the native and natural. So you can kind of see it behind us, the native sort of planting. It's not just... Uh, director saying we have to do this is something that I take a lot of pride in and like where the plan is to eventually plant every second um, fence line on the farm with a native sort of combination there's a bit of this bit of that and bit of the other thing but 
to build a bit of shelter for the cows, but also natural appeal and just, yeah, sort of start slowly returning the land to how it was as best we can. Now, you obviously work pretty hard, but recreation is also a big factor. Yeah, hugely. Like, I probably am a little bit guilty of just getting too stuck into it because I love what I do, but it's equally something that's so important as a holiday. And I really realised that last year we had a, I had a long stretch over carving. We had a few issues and... The best thing to have, I went away for two days and like it's just, you're instantly refreshed. It might cost you 500 bucks or a thousand bucks in terms of the holiday, but that value you get back in terms of your own well-being, you're more efficient, you're more effective, you're making better decisions. So it's, um, I think a holiday is probably the thing that farmers do the worst, is the first thing that comes out of your budget when you're in a tight year is, oh well I won't go to Fiji or wherever your holiday spot may be, but I think that's something that's crucial. That your own mental well-being it might only be for a day or two even but it just refreshes you so much and I know it's it won't be cut out of my budget anytime soon and I guess your your partner is a big big strength for you as well yeah humongously like uh, the the best example I can give is obviously the grand final just gone like there's no way I would have won it without her I can guarantee that right now and I think I said in one of the interviews if you want to win the contest make sure you get a great partner like she's just from putting up with all of that, like just reading questions literally until she lost her voice, to helping, like saying when I can come home, like when I come home rather, just to get stuck into studying. And then even on the farm, like she'll, she's my relief milker on call all the time and I might have to wear it a bit, but she'll always be here. And so we work so well as a team. And that's something very interesting because she's a townie, like she was born in the town, like she'd never been on a farm really. And like the change she's made to come out here, and she enjoys it now. So, we we suit each other so well, but we're also very competitive as well. So, there's a few clashes every now and then, but no, we we suit each other well and make a good team. I think. So where to from here? I guess now you've got the cloak of knowledge. You can relax a wee bit. Yeah. So that yeah, the title and the cloak of knowledge was that's been the focus for the last three years really. <clears throat> And pretty much our entire lives are centered around that. Anything we did, anywhere we went, I was writing notes or doing questions or whatever it may be. So have a little break. That's quite a few people have sort of said, what are you going to do next? Just have a bit of a break. Actually relax for a bit. It'll be quite nice. I'm looking forward to carving. It's my favorite time of the year. So it'll be good to get into that. And then we're getting married at the end of the year. So that'll be our next big focus. Sam's looking forward to... The wedding not taking a back seat anymore to grand final, so that'll be our main focus. And then moving forward, like with the profile the grand final generates, being able to get into schools at that sort of eight, ten year old level, and I don't know whether it's even inspiring one or two kids to get involved in agriculture. This is where I can't say enough great things about farming. You don't need to have your gum boots on. You can be involved in technology, um, fertilizer, anything you want. It's such a great, vibrant an innovative industry and this, the other thing is so much money to be made in it not just at the farming level at any of the jobs like entry level jobs into agriculture pay well so you always hear that there's not enough jobs around but there's plenty of jobs here I know whenever we apply or advertise for jobs or mates do they they're always struggling to find people and so hence the reason you may have to outsource to overseas workers but yeah god it's such a great industry to be in it's so much fun too get to be outside in this beautiful freezing weather. Still to come on On The Land, we're going to be talking to Amy Adams about broadband and also having a look at the Rickerton Winter Festival. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active amino acid biostimulant, natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We'll get you thinking. Think water. I think it's all working well, Jack. <sighs> My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking. Think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking, think water. It's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of we'll everything. Get you thinking, think water. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. 
I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Peter Rudkin, as a trainer, the winter carnival's coming up. Uh, yeah, I'll have a couple going there. Um, not exactly sure what it'll have, but definitely have a two year old there, which will be a three year old by then, of course. Um, and she's heading to um, uh, the Rider Stakes at um, uh, OTAC on the 25th. So we'll make a plan after that, um, exactly where she goes. So how often do you, do you assess them before you actually put the entries in? Um, well, I suppose um, how they're sort of leading up to the races is, is, is a big thing. I haven't got anything nominated, for, say, say, for the Winter Cup, which you, you um, nominate a long, long way out. Um, I've got nothing good enough for there at this stage. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, it's normally the uh, week, uh, week, in, week in advance going into the, into the big meeting like that, you know exactly where you, where you are. What, what's your regime to get a horse ready and, and to get it right up there? Uh, trying to find a bit of form, I suppose, is the biggest thing. And um, uh, the other thing is normally the, the, um, uh, that, the best carnival coming up is normally run in the wettest sort of tracks, so you have sort of the right sort of horses um, for it. And with the northerners coming down too, you, you, you sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's, you've got to try and place your horse to, to, to sort of, um, you know, for the particular race, yeah. So you really work on their fitness? Yeah, def definitely, yeah. Uh, that's, that's the biggest thing, I suppose, um, as, a, as a lead up races to it. Um, um, anything that sort of not, not sort of uh, make the grade, of course, they'll either, either go out for a spell um, and, and the other horses coming in at the same time. So um, it's, yeah, that's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a dif dif difficult one at times. So I guess that's part of being a trainer is to assess the horses and where they're at. Oh, for sure, yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, you can't always get it right. <laughs> and, uh, it's nice when you do. Nutrition, nutrition plays a, a huge part. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah, yeah, this is. So you you build up to the, the nutrition as well. Um, yeah, yeah, that all, all come, yeah, it all comes into the trials training and fitness goes here, here, definitely, yeah. You got a couple of three-year-olds that are probably looking pretty good. Did we get the names? Um, one definitely <laughs> at this stage because it won just the other day. Um, I was lucky enough to pick it up from the from the uh, cracker sales just recently and didn't pay a lot for it, um, mainly because it's, it's only a pint size, it's only 14 in one hands, and it put a lot of people off, um, but it's obviously got a heart like a lion, and I've given it um, three starts in the South Island for two seconds and a win, so there's not much wrong with it. And the name is? Um, I know that. And the other one is um, Mr. Tool, um, he's only just come back into work, so um, he could be right for the three year races as well. He's won a trial up north, and um, I, I gave one start on the way down at, at Blenheim, and uh, against the older horses, even though he's a two-year-old. Um, went alright, but he was shin sore, so I've turned him out. So um, he's only just come back, back in the last two days. It's the Rural Broadband. Pretty hot potato, what's the latest? It's a really hot potato. Everywhere I go, actually, one of the, the number one issues people want to raise with me is how they can get online, what their internet speeds are like, what their cell phone coverage is like. And look, I totally get that. I live out in a, a rural district of Canterbury. Uh, and I can tell you, when I became the Minister of Communications, I couldn't get cell phone coverage at my home. And we were getting a whopping 0 0.2 megabits a second. So for those of you who aren't techies, that's not quite dial up, but pretty close. Yeah. So what we've been doing since we've been in government is trying to massively move the, the bar up on, on connectivity in the rural areas. And I think this is so critically important to our future, Rob, because if you look at not only the amount of, of business and economic activity that comes out of our rural communities, but also the need to get services out into those areas, whether it's schooling or healthcare or community outreach, and the internet is such an incredible enabler of that. So well, we've seen, we've, we've, you know, sorry, we've, right. we've, no, got to, we've got to lift that bar, we've got to get 
good high-speed reliable connectivity both fixed and cellular out to almost every part of New Zealand and it's a massive job because we started from a very low base but already we've seen a threefold increase in speeds considerable footprint increase in, in cellular but more to do so it's, it's a work in progress it's something I'm incredibly proud of what we've done but look I know there's still frustration out there and there's still a lot more that we're, we're working on and there's more to come. But basically it is, mm. it is rolling. Absolutely. So we started building it in about 2010. So I often say to people, the only way we could have got this out faster uh, is if we'd been elected sooner. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I know people want it overnight. You know, I, I get that. I wish we could. But this is, a, in the rural area, a six-year program for Stage 1. Uh, and in, in the urban areas, a, a nine-year program. We're halfway through. We're ahead of, ahead of schedule. We're within budget. We've... 50% of the build finished, we've just connected our 100,000 UFB, UFB customer. We've got about 270,000 uh, rural customers who can now connect to faster broadband. But what I'm in the middle of right at the moment is what we're calling RBI2, so the Rural Broadband Program 2 uh, and the Mobile Black Spot Fund. So this time I've gone out to councils and said, look, I've got sort of $360 million to play with, which sounds like a huge amount of money, but when you're yeah. talking about a big country, it doesn't go that far. Uh, and I've said to the councils, work with me and identify where it's most critical that we improve the coverage and how councils can help us with looking at how they uh, consent it and help facilitate it. Because what we were seeing was an awful lot of the money going on consenting for the build. So this is about saying to councils, you tell me where it's most needed, you tell me how you're going to help, uh, and we'll work out what the next stage of, of both faster and a, and a better reach of broadband and, and cell phone coverage goes. Is it just l the logistics mm. of getting it done and getting the equipment in line? It's partly that. So the, the, the main part is, is building the physical infrastructure. Uh, and I often say to rural communities, this is like putting in the railways. You know, not, we're all far too young, of course, but if we think back to you know, when the railways were first put in and it just opened up vast areas of land for economic development. This is the same thing. This is the digital highway. And once that infrastructure is in place, uh, it is the beginning of a whole new way of thinking about how we connect to the world, how we connect with each other, uh, how we run our businesses. And if you think about, you know, on farm, I used to be Minister for the Environment uh, in the last, last go-round, Rob, and when I look at some of the challenges farms have with, with environmental management and water quality, effluent, animal health, pasture cover, some of the what we call machine-to-machine -machine communication tools that are coming out is going to make the management of all of those issues so much easier in a real-time sense, and the internet enables all of that. So we get the infrastructure built, and then the services come over the top of it. People start thinking differently about how they run their businesses, how they connect. And I tell you, we'll look back 10 years from now, I promise you, and we will be using this connectivity in ways we can't even imagine today. It's, it's that exciting and that transformative, which is why I get pretty <laughs> fired up about it. And rightly so. Yeah. How's the cell phone coverage? Mm. Because that's another way of Absolutely. getting internet and things. Yeah, of course. And that's the exciting thing, isn't it? It used to be you sat at your computer. Now, of course, with your smart device, your smartphone, your iPad, uh, you can be connected to the internet anywhere you are. Uh, and again, if you think about the rural community, there's not many of us who sit behind a desk all day. Usually you're in the ute or in the paddock or the tractor or out and about. So on, that, on the go uh, is critical. So what we've done just recently, and this gets kind of techy, I'm sorry, but we, we, no, we, auctioned, off, we auctioned off a block of spectrum uh, a year or so ago called the 700 spectrum. Now this is a really exciting piece of spectrum because it has incredible coverage, what we call propagation, so coverage reach in rural areas. Uh, and we knew that the, the telco companies would fight you know, cats and dogs for it because it's such a, an incredible coverage tool. So as part of selling that to them, we made them promise that if they bought it and compared to the amount they bought, they had to promise to extend their cell phone footprint year on year throughout the build. So we've got both Telecom, uh, sorry, Spark, Vodafone and Two Degrees all committed to extending the reach of their cell phone network across New Zealand. It's currently at about 90% footprint of, of where we live, not so much land area. Uh, but with these obligations, we're not only going to see that extended, but we're going to make sure that coverage is not just so you can get a call and send a text, mm. but that you can get good data, internet connectivity across at least 90% uh, of New Zealand. And with my mobile black spot fund, we're going to come in uh, and fill in those black spots out in the, in the, in the rural areas. I was going to say, what's this mobile black spot? Ah, but it, it's that, very that's exciting. where nothing is, you can't get anything at the moment. That's right. And then, look, there are some areas <clears> that just aren't commercial for, for the companies to put a cell phone tower in, but I think a, a real 
benefit to New Zealand. So we think about the state highway network. You know, there's, from, a, from a safety perspective, people really want to be able to get cell phone coverage near our major state highways. And most of the main routes are not too bad, but some of the tourist routes off highways 1, 2, 6 and the like get quite patchy. Uh, and I know in my area, State Highway 73 out to Arthur's Pass or 75 out to Akaroa. They're not, they're not exactly back of beyond, but there's big cell phone black spots and quite dangerous pieces of road. <clears throat> and the other part of that is to look at some of our unique, iconic tourist spots where, you know, they're beautiful because they're remote and no one's there. But we want the tourists kind of coming in and connecting to the world and Instagramming and sending messages to their family around the world saying, wow, this is incredible, come and see it. Uh, so that will enable us to, to make that happen. And it's taking a photograph on your cell phone yeah. and sending it to somebody around the world with yeah. a wee note saying, wish you were here. Absolutely. Well, even now you can you can Periscope roll, which is pretty you cool. Which what? is a Periscope, <laughs> it's very cool. It's a, it's, it's a live streaming app. So I can be uh, holding up my phone and broadcasting the conversation we're having or our picnic at Milford Sound real time around the world to, you know, well, if I had them, hundreds of thousands of followers, but some people do. Uh, so look, the ways you can reach out now are, are endless and they're growing all the time and we want New Zealand to be right at the forefront of that. Which is why, of course, On The Land, this is my little commercial, mm, On The Land mm. is, is actually going web and YouTube. Absolutely. And and Facebook and the whole thing. And isn't that the reality is that, you know, I'm also the Minister of Broadcasting as well as Minister of Communications and I specifically asked to have both of those portfolios because the reality is the way we get our news and our entertainment and our content isn't, isn't old school anymore. It's not you sit down and watch your television for your audio visual and you listen to your radio for your, for your, for your uh, audio. Now, of course, you can get it on any screen, on the go, fixed, wherever you, know, wherever mm. you are. Mm. Uh, and, and I think we're all thinking differently about how we provide content, how we access information, whether it's domestic or global. Uh, and we've got to have systems that facilitate that and of course the infrastructure to make it happen. So it's great. The younger generation of farmer probably yeah. doesn't buy a newspaper, probably doesn't watch television. <clears throat> no. He or she just literally gets all their information off stuff and yeah. whatever. I mean, I haven't bought a newspaper no. for years. Neither have I. Well, look, you know, I'm, I'm a politician, so I'm reasonably interested in what's in the news. We've stopped subscribing to the paper. I get everything online through, you know, through apps that give me not only the local papers, but papers all around the world. And by the time I've had my first coffee, I've checked out not only all the New Zealand main papers, but what's happening in Australia, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the States. You know, from my desk, it's, it's incredibly easy. I can do it on the bus if I... I do catch the bus occasionally, not that often. Uh, but, you know, on my cell phone now, I'm never home at 6 o'clock to watch the news, but I can watch it on demand or on off their mobile site, clips off YouTube when it suits me, and that, and that um, time shifting is, is so critical to the younger generation now, what we call appointment viewing, where you had to sit down at 6 o'clock to watch the news. That's it. dead. You know, that really is dead for most people. Uh, and I think we've got, to, we've got to be ready for that. I mean, I want to have a short break at the moment and then we'll come back Great. with more if we may. Of course. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active amino acid biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We'll get you thinking. Think water. I think it's all working well, Jack. <sighs> My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking. Think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking. Think water. It's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of everything. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good.
before we move on to other portfolios, mm. cyberbullying. Yeah. Well, look, this is probably the, the downside of this exciting new internet world that we're living in, is that, you know, back when you and I were young, everyone said a few things in the playground and was a bit mean to some kid or mean. And look, that's part of life. It's not nice. It's never been nice, but it's, it's been something we're familiar with. But what happens, of course, when it gets online? is that the posts are often anonymous, so people feel much more free to attack and say vicious, nasty things. But for, for even more than that, it can go global, you know, go viral, as they call it, within seconds. Mm. Uh, you know, and with, within a, a couple of minutes, something can be seen by literally millions of people, and it's almost impossible to completely remove. And it's not just saying something a bit harsh or that I might like, not like the sound of. It's really nasty, aggressive stuff. You know, continual, repeated calls for people to kill themselves and saying nasty, horrible things to them. It's, it's issues like what we call revenge porn, which is where you know a couple have perhaps taken intimate photos of each other when they were together in happier times, and then as part of breaking up, one partner decides to get their own back by posting those photos all over the internet. Uh, and at the moment, there's really no quick, easy way to, to get get that stuff taken down. If you're what, looking at that. Well, we've just we've just passed the new law actually. So we've just passed the the Harmful Digital Communications Act, and that does a couple of things. It sets up an agency whose job it is to to both mediate resolutions in the first instance, to educate the public, uh, and to work with the district court to get takedown orders for for harmful material. Uh, and also at the very nasty end of the scale, you know, we're talking about people like the roast busters who not only did some pretty horrible things, but then posted it all online. Uh, there's actually criminal offences. So for those at the really nasty end of town who've gone out and encouraged people to kill themselves by just vicious, relentless, uh, aggressive bullying, uh, it enables some action to be taken. So it's, I think it's about reflecting that, that communications in a digital world are different. Uh, the harm factor is potentially a lot higher. And this is setting up a framework to make very clear uh, what's expected uh, and to create an agency to, to help, as I say, work through those issues in a, in a quick, responsive way. It's not, you know, the internet doesn't wait for you to go off to court and wait six months for a court date. No. You need pretty quick redress and that's what this is about. And we look at Marsh Insurance, for example, yeah. that, that around the world in a matter of minutes. Absolutely. Or, or you, and it's not just young people. Often people think this is about schoolyard bullying. Uh, actually, you look at someone like Charlotte Dawson, you know, who was driven to take her own life after just relentless, horrific, ongoing uh, harassment. Uh, and, you know, some people have been saying, oh, gosh, it's going to be a limit on free speech. Well, free speech has always had its, its limits on it. You know, you can't go into a crowded theatre and yell fire. And, you, can't, you know, there are some things that society doesn't accept. But it's not about stopping anyone saying what they think in a normal way. But it is about saying bullying, harassment, threats, uh, and revealing really intimate uh, images are not okay. So is it sort of like, are you modifying the defamation Laws or it, it's not through defamation. Defamation still exists, but some of this is true. Uh, I mean, if, if there are if there are nasty, intimate, well, nasty, but intimate photos that have been taken in, in one situation, it wouldn't come under defamation because those things did occur. But mm. it was never intended that they would be put all over Facebook and sent around the world. Or the Marsh insurance video, for example, it's, it's not defamation. It's true, uh, yeah, but, but nonetheless, I'm... it shouldn't be published and sent around the world potentially. See, I. I wasn't on Facebook because mm. I didn't get involved and then somebody mm. with a warped sense of humour put me on and said a whole lot of things which were defamatory and mm. I, um, you know, I probably could have at that point. You could have. Well you could have probably gone and taken a defamation suit but if you've ever talked to lawyers, I mean I used to be a lawyer Rob and I did a bit of defamation law and look it's, it's, it's a good remedy for, for certain cases but the reality is it has to be a very very high level of harm before you know, your lawyer is saying you're up for $100,000 <coughs> for, for a defamation suit. You know, mm. you're not going to do it for a lot of things, and a lot of really nasty damage is done under that radar. So it's it's getting that balance right. People will have views, and I'm not going to like it. I don't like everything that's said about me online. It's pretty nasty, but in my job, you learn to cope with it. But that's quite well, you different. Have to, though. Well, you shouldn't. But but that's quite different from ongoing perpetual abuse, harassment, bullying, intimidation. You know, we're not talking about something I just don't like because I say, oh, that Amy Adams, you know, she's a silly old cow. That's fine, but that's not going to breach this act. But if someone was putting, uh, you know, nasty, insidious threats... Well, you can modify threats, photographs and things as well. You can do all sorts of things. And, okay. and the damage online is just, that can be caused is so much different. So this is just reflecting, look, the digital world is incredibly exciting, the opportunities are limitless, but there is another side we have to think about, and 
ha cyberbullying, just like cybersecurity, are part of just adapting to this new world. And that comes into privacy law, doesn't it? Yeah, look, it does. And, and it is, again, this interface between uh, what happens online and how we continue to, to keep New Zealand and New Zealanders safe. And as part of what we have to do as the government, we have to think about how we protect uh, New Zealanders. And, uh, you know, there was a a really nasty case, I'm sure that your, your viewers are, uh, have heard of, of the father in Dunedin who murdered his two children, a uh, chap Livingston, and the coroner's report came out recently and she made the point that one of the big failings as to why the agencies didn't join the dot sooner about the risks involved in this particular case was because they were all scared to share the information they had because they were worried about breaching the privacy laws. You know, when, when Philip Smith uh, did a runner to Rio because he decided mm. that would be nicer than our prisons, you know, there was concerns about whether the corrections department who had the information about who could leave was able to share that with customs so that they couldn't get through the border. Now, to me, there's, a, there's, a, there's something gone seriously wrong if we're more worried about breaching Philip Smith's privacy in that situation than we are about upholding the laws of New Zealand. So I think the whole privacy settings and how they work and whether they are... Uh, stopping some, some you know, good protection and safety of New Zealanders needs to be looked at because if you take it to the nth degree, uh, you know, we can't keep New Zealanders safe. And I think if I, say to, you know, if I say to you or I say to anyone walking down the street, do you expect your government to be able to, to join the dots on someone like uh, Edward Livingston or, or, or stop someone like Philip Smith you know, leaving the country when he shouldn't? I think the obvious answer is, well, yes, of course we do. Uh, mm. And yet somehow we've got into this catatonic state of we can't, tell any, any, can't share that information with anyone because it'll you know, be a privacy issue. So we just have to just get that balance right. And that flows into family violence. I mean, everything we've sort yeah. of been talking about flows from one to the other. Yeah, and actually, this is the amazing thing with my, my um, suite of portfolios. They, they link up in ways you wouldn't expect. But look, family violence is one that I'm really worried about. Uh, when I look at the crime stats, New Zealand is safer than it's been for 35 years, which is incredibly good. Uh, but the one area that really isn't dropping, in fact, it's going up, is family violence. Now, it's going up, but we think, and we, we can never be sure, we think that's an increase in reporting, which is actually a good thing. Uh, but nonetheless, what it tells us is that we have one of the highest rates of intimate partner violence in the OECD. Uh, and, you know, that's not the New Zealand I like to think that I live in. I like to think mm. that we live in, you know, we're not naive. We know there are, are, are problems here and there are families in, in real stress and, and dysfunction. But I can't, you know, accept that New Zealand should have the highest rate of family violence in the OECD. That's not what I want for the country. And I think it's not something the government can magic away by one program or, you know, a new law. I think it's something that all society has to think about. How do we do this better? Uh, and what we're doing isn't, isn't cutting through enough. Do you know... Half of all the homicides in New Zealand are family violence. So if we could cut our murder rate in half if we got on top of family violence. And it's not just mm. city, is it? No, it isn't. And, and that's one of the misapprehensions, I think. So people like to think, oh, well, that happens somewhere else. Maybe it happens in you know, South Auckland or somewhere that isn't us. It's not true. It happens every part of New Zealand. It happens in every uh, economic Band. It happens in every ethnic group, it happens at every age level, uh, and sometimes actually there's more of a shame factor if you feel like you live in a you know, wealthier, um, you know, more European community, you think, gosh, I can't possibly admit that this is happening. Uh, and you know, one of the scary things is that we know on average, it's usually a woman, not always, but, mm. but a, a, let's, you know, a woman might suffer 21 instances of family violence before she'll ring the police. 21 instances before she'll even pick up the it, phone. That's the average. It's and that's the average. <clears throat> and yet there's a notification to police every five minutes. Every five minutes the police are being rung about a family violence incident. You know, it makes up more than 40% of all police time. So we want to think about where, what our police are doing and how they're keeping us safe. More than 40% of their time goes on dealing with family violence. So this is a massive issue in New Zealand. Uh, and I think all of us, from the government to the, to the social sector, to communities, to neighbours, we all have to be thinking about how we can play our part in, in getting on top of it because it's not the future I want for my children. Well, we no, certainly not. Mm. And but it's a very hard one because, as you said, it's the shame factor. Yeah, it is. It is the shame factor, and and it's, it's a situation where often by the time it's it's developed to a you know a level of severity, the confidence of the victim has been worn right down. They they feel somehow that they deserve it, or in some communities it's normal. It's what they've grown up seeing. They don't see it as any different. So it really is an intergenerational thing to cut through. Uh, and it goes right from the sort of the, the earlier, lower level expressions of control and, and you know, uh, emotional abuse and, and shouting and the like, right through to murder, you know. So there's a, there's a full spectrum and, and the ranges of assistance that are needed are different. If we can get the perpetrators into some anger management and stopping violence programs sooner, that helps. 
but equally there are times we just need to get get the abuser out of there, keep the woman safe, get the kids safe, allow her to strengthen her home. So I've just announced, for example, some funding to enable us to go in and put um, security around a, a woman's home so she can stay there. You know, bars on the window, well, not bars, but you know, locks on the windows, <coughs> outside security lights, dead bolts. Because if we can keep the woman and her children in the home, uh, it's a far easier path for them. If they, if leaving your abusive partner means you've got to pack up your kids and your life and your connections and your community and the kids' schools and go, that's a, that's a pretty big barrier to get over. It is. So we've got to look at a number of things. But you know, what we're doing isn't isn't working. Uh, you know, there's some very, very hard-working, well-meaning people, but we, we have to do more. Minister, thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome. And of course, that's also on our website on the land. I'm Rob Cope-Williams. You've either been watching on the land or you've just missed it, but I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.